up, we have gigs. I should put a thumbnail up of me doing this. Like, don't. Don't buy a Super Custom. So, are you considering buying a JDM Japanese import van? Well, here's five things that I love about mine and five things that are really, really annoying. So, let's get started. So, I've always had old cars and I'm in the habit of checking the engine oil and the fluids under the bonnet at least once a week, especially if I'm traveling quite far. For this thing, it's a bit of a faff. The engine's underneath the seat. You can't simply just quickly pop up the bonnet, pull the dipstick out, have a look, put it back, off you go on your way. You have to lift up the entire seat, then pull out the dipstick. Actually, it's more involved than that. You've got to undo two latches and they can be quite fiddly. Then you've got to lift up the whole passenger seat, put it on a strap so that it doesn't fall down and knock you out, and then check the oil. And of course, you've got to lean over the front wheel and the actual body of the car because the engine's in the middle. The second thing that is really annoying besides these pipes here, oh, you, please. Uh, is just getting in it and driving off. So, this seat is one meter off the ground. So unlike a normal car where you just sort of scoot on in and <laughs> off you go, this thing is annoying. And especially because um, the seats on this edge here on vans tend to wear faster. So this one's got a little bit of wear in it, not too much. Um, and that's because people hop in like this and you drive along. But when you get out, people don't like stepping out. So they're just kind of like a water slide, <laughs> slide out especially if there's another car right here and you can't swing the door all the way open to get in and utilize a step here um, it's annoying because the door might only open that much and so not only do you have to squeeze in here but you have to get yourself a meter off the ground using one handle and half a step and when this is slippery it's kind of like pushing off into the back so if you slip you're not just going to fall You'll go back about two meters and crack your head on something. Ugh. And of course, by the time you wiggle into the seat, your pants have come off a little bit. <coughs> so number three on the list of annoying things about having a JDM van, and it applies to any van, I guess, is undercover car parks. Uh, so the vans are naturally quite tall, and a lot of undercover car parks, especially where I live, are about 2.1 meters at its maximum height. You know those little things that hang from the top tell you what the maximum height is? Um, this van is pretty much 2.1 meters. And uh, I know they allow for a little bit of leeway, but it's always nerve wracking, especially if you are considering a Japanese van like this high ace that has three sunroofs and two of those sunroofs lift up like a spoiler. So you definitely do not want to leave those up, forget and drive into a low undercover garage because chances are you'll rip them off. So reason number four, or swatting flies so you, men can multitask is it handles like a boat I know people say that their cars handle like a boat that big SUVs handle like a boat look I had two Land Cruisers I had an 80 series and a 105 and they handle like Ferraris compared to this um, this is like a boat you take a roundabout too fast in it and it doesn't feel unstable it's not like it's gonna tip over it just leans a lot um, this thing's got coil suspension instead of leaf springs in the back like a commercial van it's designed to be the ultimate cruiser comfortable supple um, and carry people in utter peace and quiet uh, but when you take corners in it it likes to lean over this is the definition of a boat on wheels so if you're in a rush this is not the kind of car to buy okay so reason number five is chances are if you watch me or if you're considering a four-wheel drive van like this, uh, you're into your four-wheel driving and off-roading, which obviously means you go on the beach or well, whatever kind of four-wheel driving you do, chances are you let your air pressure out of your tires. And then if you're a good four-wheel driver, and because they're so cheap now, chances are you have an air compressor to pump it back up again. Usually in a Land Cruiser or something like that, you open the back. Imagine there's an air compressor here. I forgot to bring one. You grab it, you come out to the front. At this point, you'd have the bonnet up so you can plug in your air compressor battery terminals to the battery so that you can reinflate your tires. 
Unfortunately, the same thing like checking the engine oil in this thing, the battery lives here, underneath this seat. The engine lives here, if you can picture where the, uh, the center console is, and the battery's here. So every time you want to inflate your tires, the entire engine cover has to come up, whoever's sitting in this seat has to come out, and then you have... Actually, let me just show you. There's actually another service panel that you have to remove after, after getting rid of everything in the cup holders, undoing the two retaining clips that hold this engine cover in place. That comes up, click it in place here. So you have your engine, but you want to connect your air compressor. Well, you got to lift up this piece of car carpet, undo this latch, remove this panel, and there's your battery. So you can imagine just how annoying it would be if you just wanted to quickly get out, stop, adjust your tire pressures, maybe you're down too low, maybe you went through a really boggy patch of sand, you had to drop down to maybe 10 or 8 psi, and now you're on firm sand again, you want to go up to maybe 14 or 16, <sighs> You gotta do all of this. You might think, oh well, I'll just leave it, and that's when you roll a tire off a rim, and things get really interesting. So, that's five things that are really annoying about having not just a not just a van, but a JDM van, because realistically it's only the Japanese vans that have the engines in the middle underneath the seats. But in saying that, the benefits far outweigh the annoyances. So here are five things that I love and I think you'll love about having something like this. So, as I said, there are five, well, there's more than five, but I've chosen five amazing reasons why you might want to consider a van like this. This has to be the nicest car that I've ever owned, and I've owned some pretty cool cars. I've had an 80 series turbo diesel Land Cruiser, which was really powerful. Everyone in the world seems to now know how great those cars are. I've had a 105 series Land Cruiser, similar to a 100 series. If you know it, you know it. If you don't, you don't. But this is the ultimate cruiser. They should have called this the High Ace Super Custom Cruiser, or the High Ace Super Cruiser would have been a better name for it. Because this thing is the ultimate in long distance open road traveling. So the driving position, you sit up nice and high, much higher than say something like a Land Cruiser or just a conventional four wheel drive. And it gives you this great view out the massive panoramic front windscreen. Um, you get to see everything. The seats are super comfortable. Uh, they've got just the right amount of support. They've also got some pretty decent bolstering. You can see the contours there. So while I did say that this handles like a boat, if you do happen to lean into a corner, these hug you pretty well. The controls are so simple. It's classic Toyota and it has that classic Toyota click. Controls are easy, it's easy to drive, the pedals are nice, the seating position is more like a couch. Um, you know, in a certain number of pickup trucks, for example, you sit with your legs stretched way out in front of you versus this where you sit with your legs down in a more natural sort of seating position like a couch. And that's what this is. This is an eight-seater couch for the road. And being the ultimate cruiser, the seats in this thing aren't bunched up like you would think in, say, something like a people mover. There is plenty of room to stretch your legs out. These passengers can put their feet up here. The back passengers have a ton of leg room. And being the ultimate cruiser means that you can choose the amount of leg room you want. By pulling these two tabs here, this back seat can move all the way back, further than it is now, to all the way up here. So that is a massive amount of movement. Plus, being the ultimate cruiser again, you can have a huge amount of legroom for every single passenger. Plus, even with this seat all the way back, there is a stack load of luggage space. And, again, being the ultimate cruiser, there is a built-in storage box. I have a tarp in there at the moment because I moved house. Uh, 
where you can put things like water bottles, spares, recovery equipment, some snacks, things like that. So reason number two that I love this car is it's so versatile. Um, the combination of being able to carry people and luggage, and a lot of luggage and a lot of freight, is what makes it so great. I've never had a van before. I've had a ute or a pickup truck and I've had wagons, but never a van. I really thought, why would I need when there's only two of us an eight seater van? But recently um, we moved house and I fit an entire one bedroom apartment uh, into this. So I'll cut to a shot of all of the stuff in our house that fit in one load in this van. I did have to go back and get my toolbox and the old wheels and tires separately. But in terms of fitting an entire apartment into this, it's versatile. The seats lay flat, the front seats turn around and lay flat. So you've got a completely flat floor and underneath, you can also stretch out longer items like uh, bed frames. So not only is it the ultimate cruiser, it's versatile, which makes it usable every single day, whether you're carrying people, freight, or a mix of both. So reason number three is this thing is a capable four-wheel drive. Um, and I want to show you just how capable it is by looking at the components that it has underneath. Uh, this thing is so versatile, and I guess it's keeping with number two on the list, versatility, um, is just look at the springs on this thing. I mean, that's some pretty heavy duty stuff right there. Actually, why'd that fall off? No, that's not for my car. Let me show you underneath. Ooh so the video might be on its side, but look at the um, lower control arms for the rear suspension, the trailing arms. That is massive. I mean, that's my first, for example, and it's bigger than my first. So it's huge. The transfer case and the gearbox is something that you would find under a Land Cruiser or a Prado. This is the original exhaust, 23 years old, and it's got the springs on the retainers and the fasteners. And underneath, at the back, if you look at the rear diff, that is a live axle Hilux rear end. This thing is not just built to be heavy duty, it's built to go across some pretty treacherous terrain and do it year after year. Reason number four is uh, this thing's powerful. It's not a race car, but it is torquey. It's got so much grunt down low where you need it. Boost is amazing in this thing. Um, so reason number four is it's not underpowered. I've had Pajeros, I've had a whole bunch of different four-wheel drives, I've had a Navara, and they just don't have any sort of torque, especially down low. You don't want to have to rev a diesel out just to get it to move, um, and especially if you want to tow something. This is able to do anything, uh, just because it's got the power. Right when you think you're at full boost, you put your foot down a little bit more, and it gets up, it, it gains like 50% more torque and power. And this is from a standard engine, standard boost, standard everything, standard turbo, um, and being 23 years old. This thing feels like it'll pull anything, um, and it feels like even with a full load on board when I was moving house, with all my furniture, everything inside it, um, it still just drove normally. The suspension rode a bit better because it's meant to have a bit of weight in it. But yeah, one day when I decide to get a tow bar on it and pull a boat with it, or a caravan, uh, I have no concerns that it won't be able to do that. So, reason number four on my list of why this thing is so cool and why you should get one of these if you are considering a Super Custom or a JDM van is I'd say go for one of these with a 1KZTE engine because they are able to pull right down low where you need it. That's what you want from a turbo diesel four drive. That's why you're buying one of these, right? I personally wouldn't consider this if it had like a 2.4 litre petrol in it but three litre turbo diesel, that's what I expect. And I wasn't disappointed. Okay, so reason number five as to why you might wanna consider a JDM van like this high super custom, maybe even a Mitsubishi Delica, is actually this one's gonna be a bit more complicated to explain. I'm not really good at talking, I'm quite stupid. Um, I have all these Things that I want to say in my mind, but when I open my mouth, the words just don't really come out properly. And um, that is that I believe 90s cars would become the most collectible out of any generation of cars. And the reason I say that is K2 
cars, as much as they've advanced today with autonomous emergency braking, I mean, hell, even autonomous driving, um, the thing about the 90s cars is they've got everything that we're accustomed to expecting in cars today. And see, where I grew up, we were surrounded by these. We were surrounded by a Skyline. I mean, literally, every day sitting in traffic, there would be a Skyline GTS 4, a couple of GTS Skylines, a couple of GTS-Ts, WRXs, Evos, maybe an RX-7 or 2, Land Cruisers, these things, uh, Mazda GDXs, Starlet GTs, and it was just a common regular thing. But overseas in different parts of the world, things like air conditioning was uh, an option, which we didn't really know of. We didn't have any options. Most, I'd say 90% of the cars on our roads uh, where I grew up were Japanese imports, JDM cars, and they all had air conditioning. They all had central locking, they all had power windows, they all had power mirrors. Uh, they had all of those basic functions that we have come to expect out of every car today. It was only when I started traveling overseas that I realized that some cars that look very similar to the cars that I was used to didn't have aircon, or maybe it had air conditioning, but it didn't have central locking or uh, power mirrors or power windows. Um, these cars from the 1990s have everything. So a car like this, I believe, will be the most collectible because it comes from the 90s. It's got central locking, power steering, power brakes, power mirrors, uh, power windows, ABS, airbags. It's got the basics. The basics that mean you can just get in it, turn the key and the engine will start. It doesn't have a carburetor anymore. Well, it's a diesel, but you know what I mean. This is the first generation or, or sort of the last generation of cars where, um, you know, I, I still remember having to get into the older cars growing up, and I'm not that old, um, and choking it and playing with the carburetor and hitting the accelerator while you start it on a cold morning and it being lumpy and, and remembering not to let go of the accelerator when you come to a stop first thing in the morning uh, otherwise the engine will die but the thing about the 90s cars is the turnkey cars if you maintain them and look after them you get in it and you just drive off that's all you have to do and if you get too hot you turn the air conditioning on if it's a nice day out you push a button and the electric windows roll down you like the song turn up the music Chances are it's going to have pretty decent speakers. Is it a nice starry night outside? You can open up the sunroofs. And there's good storage. Storage there. They've got a regular glove box. If something does happen, the fuses are normal. Blade fuses, and they live just underneath the dashboard. The gear lever is very simple. It's what you would expect. Park, reverse, neutral, drive. The handbrake is conventional. I guess up until maybe people that are being born right now, when they see a handbrake when they get older, they might not know what to do with it. But for the most part, these things are just so easy to drive. And that is the best thing about this car. Um, number five on the list is, while it's got all the modern conveniences that you expect, underneath it has basic mechanical robust engineering. So, while this is a Japanese import, no matter where you are in the world, if something happens to this, chances are any old mechanic will be able to diagnose what's wrong with it, order the parts, bolt it on, and you can be on your way. It is not rocket science. It's not overly complicated. It does not need, does not need a laptop or proprietary software to diagnose it. It's all basic mechanicals wrapped up in a nice, comfy body and interior with basic controls that everyone can use and understand. So, number five on the list is it's got all the necessities you would expect while still being robust and basic enough not just to take you anywhere but to be able to be repaired anywhere in the world. So, that's my five reasons why I love my van and five things that I find annoying about it. And if you are on the fence about getting one of these, then I hope this has given you a little bit of insight 
and helps you out a little bit. Okay, thanks for watching. I've had enough of these flies. I'm out of here. Bye. Forgot to mention one more thing that I really love about this car, um, and I hope you can hear it. I'm going to cut to a clip. Is it sounds like a little tractor. Uh, this little hollow, that grisly turbo diesel sound. Um, and it's only at really low revs while it's sort of crawling along, nowhere near on full boost. Um, and it sounds great. See if you can hear it. I hope it picked it up. If not, you know I like it. <laughs>